Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining me for our WPA3 Advancements in Wireless Security discussion. Uh, my name is Steve War. I'm a Distinguished Architect from uh, Cisco Systems U.S. Public Sector Division. Uh, pleasure to be here today. I'll just give you a quick background. Uh, I've been in the networking industry for the better part of 25 years. Um, from a wireless security perspective, one of the day jobs I have outside of Cisco is uh, I luckily get to work within the Wi-Fi Alliance, um, and I work with a bunch of great companies in uh, the Wi-Fi Alliance security uh, both technical and marketing working groups. And I also uh, work within some of the IEEE groups as well. So what the whole goal for today is to uh, get everybody a little bit better understanding of what's going on in, in the world with WPA3 Enhanced Open and a couple of the other new security things that have been happening uh, since WPA2 was first introduced into the market. We spent a lot of time in the last couple of years uh, really focusing on enhancing security so again, really what the whole goal for today, know where and when to deploy the new uh, security technologies. And even, you know, if you haven't turned it on, figure out where to turn it on in your network architecture and uh, just kind of kick the tires on it. As uh, right now, we've got a lot of new products coming out, not just Cisco, but vendors all together. The Wi-Fi Alliance is pushing really to get everybody supporting WPA3 as, as quickly as possible. So in kicking it off, I know everybody's at the RSA conference and there's a, uh, you know, security and usability, right? There's always a trade-off. Uh, you can over rotate either way, which can cause security challenges. So really what we want to do and kind of the focus of this is know where and when and how to deploy the different technologies, whether it's personal versus enterprise, transition modes, e-pipes, or cryptographic strength. We're not going to go into every possible use case. We're really just going to kind of hit the highlights of what's been going on in, in WPA3, the developments and all the cool things that we're trying to bring to market uh, under the Wi-Fi Alliance WPA3 brand. So uh, funny slide. You know, uh, interest in wireless security technologies, typically uh, very few people are interested in wireless security until there's an attack. Uh, once the attack occurs, you know, everything happens in the media. Uh, we fix everything as quickly as possible. And then it's kind of like back to normal uh, and nobody's really paying attention to security any longer. So, uh, you know, what we're trying to do in the Wi-Fi Alliance is really smooth that curve out and make security a continuous development and continuous innovation uh, within the Wi-Fi Alliance, within industry. Uh, so that we can bring the best security as much, you know, as quickly as possible uh, to the market and into the hands of consumers and IT folks. Uh, I put this slide in here as well. It's kind of a joke. Um, we've been working on WPA3 for probably the better part of six to seven years. Uh, so yeah, it, it really was a five-year mission since uh, before we started working on WPA3 to, to actually when uh, it was mandated. Uh, so as of July 1st, 2020, which was last year, all new Wi-Fi certified products I have to support WPA3, which includes Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E, and all current and future programs that are going to be launched. So we're, we're embedding the best technology, the most secure technology, um, right from the start so that we don't have to kind of go look back and see if we can bring uh, the best security to play. So a uh, real quick view of where we are with the Wi-Fi Alliance security program history. What you'll see, you know, we started back with WPA back in 2003. Again, it's a just a uh, short history lesson on where we've been so that you can see where we've actually started to accelerate focus on security. So we had WPA in 2003, WPA2 in 2004. And then from 2004 to roughly 2018, not a lot of things happened in the WPA space for um, you know us doing things in the security world. So uh, we did some security enhancements in 2018 right after Crack uh, came out. Then we launched WPA3 in 2018. We launched Wi-Fi Enhanced uh, Open We'll get to that in a little bit. And then we saw some things that happened with Dragon Blood, and we quickly came out with uh, another WPA3 uh, revision, uh, December 2019 and December 2020. Each one of those continues to add features and new capabilities under the WPA3 brand. That, you know, again, most people that are looking at what goes on in WPA3 don't necessarily see that we've actually had a continual focus for the last uh, probably six to seven years on bringing new security features and capabilities to market. So the best thing is you're here, right? So in December 2020, we released an update. Uh, we'll talk about really, we'll talk about pretty much WPA3, what happened in 2019 and 2020 to bring uh, those things to market and what new features that are beyond what you normally see in personal and enterprise. So uh, let's start with the, with, the, with the first one. So uh, open networks get an upgrade, as I call it, Wi-Fi certified enhanced open. So um, this, basically we have, we have a capability, and I, and I threw some of these screenshots in here. 
So we have an enhanced open only mode. And I want to really bring for those people who want to get down into the weeds a little bit, exactly what it looks like, right? So we've got group ciphers, pairwise ciphers. The thing that's interesting about uh, enhanced open, which is based on OWE, uh, which is RFC 8110. Uh, the interesting thing here is it's uh, unauthenticated encryption, right? So this is completely different than what we do in an open network today, which is we don't authenticate and we don't encrypt. Uh, this is really an opportunity for us uh, to solve passive eavesdropping. That's what we targeted, right? It's not an open network where people can passively see the traffic that's going on, um, but we actually give you the ability to encrypt the traffic, right? So again, this falls into privacy, not necessarily security. So when people claim, oh my God, you know, enhanced open, it's still subject to certain uh, vulnerabilities and certain issues. We're never claiming here that enhanced open is solving uh, man in the middle problems. It's actually giving us a way to solve passive eavesdropping problems. So again, remember where and when and what technology you're using. If you have open networks today, you can migrate to enhanced open networks and get that passive eavesdropping security. Um, speaking of transitions, we always have transition modes, right? So anytime we're trying to transition from an older technology to a new technology, even in the case where we're going from open to enhanced open, um, again, when you look at what happens uh, when you have an open SSID enabled, um, on an enhanced open certified AP, we actually mandate that it creates a separate hidden uh, BSS with the same properties as the open BSS. Why do we do this? To make it easier for those stations, those older legacy stations that don't support enhanced open to still have an open SSID to connect to. And those that do support enhanced open, it, the transition mode allows them to actually, <clears throat> excuse me, allows them to actually make the connection. What happens in the real world is some of those legacy devices, when they see an enhanced open uh, BSS or an SSID, they may get confused on how they handle those beacons, where some legacy stays may see it as open 802.1x or PSK network, and that led to poor user experience. So what we did was we kind of created a uh, transition mode mechanism where the open SSID actually advertises in it the enhanced open SSID and information so that those stations that see the open SSID know that there's an enhanced open SSID they can connect to for enhanced security. And we do the same thing in the enhanced open SSID. We also notify, <clears throat> excuse me, those newer stations that there's an open network as well. So really the, the gist of what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get the stations that can do advanced security onto those new networks um, as quickly as possible while preserving the usability of the legacy stations that don't necessarily understand uh, what enhanced open is. So again, when moving forward, right? So that's enhanced open and what we're doing to uh, try to eliminate the challenges with open networks. So WPA2, WPA3, so we still support both. Uh, the big question I always get is why did we call it WPA3 versus a WPA2.1 or two and a half? So what we looked at was we made such significant changes between WPA2 and what we now call WPA3 we figured it was time for a major number change uh, to indicate how much work actually went into it. So one of the things that kind of goes um, unsung about what we're doing differently with WPA3 is normally WPA2 and, and, and earlier was all based around interoperability. So as long as two stations interoperated from a security perspective, everything was fine. However, what could happen in reality is you could have two stations that interoperate, but they interoperate with a less than optimal implementation, which means there could be something wrong with it. Uh, so we actually introduced conformance testing into WPA3. In conformance testing, we actually introduce um, in the um, test bed equipment, we issue or we run tests, we call them negative tests, so that um, we can detect how stations under test and devices under test are gonna respond and react to misbehaving network devices. So conformance has been really huge for us to be able to help uh, vet a lot of the stuff that's going on in both clients and in access point implementations uh, since we implemented WPA3. Uh, one of the other interesting things, there's really no information element that designates WPA3 from WPA2. We didn't go down the path of creating a new IE. Uh, really what WPA3 is defined by is the AKM cipher suite and protective management frame combinations, right? So when you look at those combinations, you can easily see uh, what WPA3 is, what the building blocks are. Now, again, when we look at PMF, or so protective management frames, it was something that came out during WPA2, but we didn't see wide adoption. 
So one of the things that we wanted to make sure we did was kind of in this building block architecture of security, um, we made sure that PMF had to be negotiated uh, for WPA3 connections. So if a, uh, a connection is classified as a WPA3 connection, PMF must be negotiated between the station and the AP. Uh, we had left it at optional in WPA2. And what we were seeing was not a lot of people, not a lot of clients were negotiating PMF, which um, leaves a fundamental hole in the initial uh, onboarding and uh, communication between the station and the AP. Um, with WPA3, it's also mandatory for Wi-Fi 6 and newer. So this is an awesome thing for us. Uh, we got it attached to the Wi-Fi 6 Mac and Fi program so that all these new Wi-Fi 6, 6E and beyond APs will all have WPA3 as the starting point. So let, let's real quick talk about modes because modes are different than brands, right? So WPA3 is a brand and then there's individual modes that happen underneath it. So um, WPA3 personal, there's an SAE mode. So what we did was we swapped out what we did for WPA2 PSK. Uh, we're using SAE, which is defined in the IEEE. And then we also created an SAE transition mode. Again, when we think about going back to enhanced open, we wanted to preserve client experience and bring the best experience and most secure possible. So how do we help those clients that may only have, or those uh, people that may only have WPA2 capable devices and now they've bought a WPA3 access point, we've got to provide them some way to be able to communicate and onboard those older devices and not have to do a flag day and kind of cut and run on some of those older devices. Uh, when we moved into WPA3 Enterprise, we have a WPA3 Enterprise only mode. Again, the main difference between this and WPA2 Enterprise is uh, PMF. We PMF shall be negotiated for all WPA3 connections. And we're working on doing some negative test cases, again, to bring those to bear so that we can make sure that we catch any uh, potentially bad acting uh, stations or access points. Uh, transition mode, transition mode, again, with WPA3 Enterprise allows both WPA2 and WPA3 Enterprise connections. This is where PMF is set to optional. Then we have this new thing that we did, uh, which was called WPA3 Enterprise 192-bit mode. In this mode, uh, we actually had looked at uh, some input from uh, different governments looking at consistent cryptographic implementations in cipher suites to avoid misconfiguration. You know, if you look at AKMs, group ciphers, uh, regular ciphers, and, and all the different things that go into uh, creating a wireless connection, including EAP types, TLS cipher suites, uh, what we looked at is being able to create a consistent uh, cipher suite or consistent bit strength across all the cipher suites. So this is where the 192 bit mode uh, came from. It's 192 bits of security when deployed in this mode. That's what you're guaranteed end to end from the station to the access point. So transition modes, again, just to touch on them real quick. Why did we do a WPA3 transition mode, right? I always get the, hey, I can support multiple BSSs on my APs today. You know, it's 2020, 2021. Uh, transition modes, they're created to preserve interop with WPA2, right? So it's really there to help end user experience. Wi-Fi is a ubiquitous technology. It's from the home user all the way to the enterprise and beyond. Home users are not necessarily going to spin up multiple BSSs at the home. So what we wanted to do was provide this easier transition. So in WPA3 transition mode or personal transition mode, uh, we can use the same passphrase between a WPA2 PSK network and a WPA3 SAE network. So just the caveat, right? So when you have a transition mode, you have to understand the security implications of transition modes. The, and in a transition mode, you're only as secure as your uh, weakest link. In this case, it's the, the lower security, the transition mode, right? So in WPA2 PSK, it still means that if I'm using the same passphrase, I can perform all the uh, attacks against the WPA2 PSK network. I can potentially get the passphrase. All that will do is get me access to the infrastructure, the network. It won't allow me to decrypt uh, the WPA3 SAE traffic over the, over the air. So again, knowing where and when to deploy transition modes and what the security implications are are critical, right? So anytime you mix and match a lower security with a higher security, uh, you're always going to have to, to address the lower security challenges in these transition modes. So again, um, know your security requirements for the, your deployment. And if having a transition mode between WPA3 and WPA2 doesn't meet your security requirements, you can always change this and have a WPA2 SSID and a WPA3 SSID with different security requirements on them. 
Uh, again, just a quick look at uh, some of the frames. Again, I want to make sure for those that, that wanted to dig in deep and see what's going on um, in WPA3 personal only. Uh, again, we're using SAE, which you can see is the AKM uh, ending in 08. It specifies SAE. Um, you can see that management frame protection is required and we're solidified around AES CCM 128 for group pairwise and uh, CMAC 128 for broadcast integrity. In the transition mode, this is where it gets interesting. So in transition mode, we have a group cipher and pairwise cipher again of AES CCM 128. But now we're actually have the ability to um, advertise multiple ACAMs in a single advertisement. So in this case, I added a couple ACAMs, right? So I added PSK, PSK SHA-256, and also SAE. And then management frame protection, that's listed as capable instead of required. And then we do broadcast integrity protocol again at CMAC 128. So this actually allows me in a single SSID to associate PSK, WPA2 PSK, uh, WPS, WPA2 PSK clients that support SHA-256, and SAE all at the same time in a single VSS. Again, knowing what your security requirements are and potential challenges, uh, just make sure that you know what AKMs you're putting on there and, and what implications that mean to the network. In WPA3 Enterprise 192, uh, again, when we look at what this is, we look at the AKM, which pretty much designates what's the requirement. AKM here is 12, which is basically saying I have to use SHA-384. Um, and then my group cipher is AES GCMP-256. And the pairwise cipher is AES GCMP-256. And the broadcast integrity protocol is GMAC-256. So the, one of the big differences between Enterprise 192 and the regular WPA2 Enterprise, you can actually see that we shifted from CCMP to GCMP. And we went from 128 to 256 in the bit string. And again, from SHA-256 to SHA-384 uh, for hashing. So again, some subtle differences here. But again, just make sure you know if you, if you need stronger security or require stronger security, there's always an option uh, with WPA3 Enterprise 192. Now, a couple of interesting things, and most people don't necessarily delve too deep into what the Wi-Fi Alliance is doing. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff now that's online and available for everybody to go out and take a look at. So the Wi-Fi Alliance security homepage, the tech specs are out there, uh, some tech spec addendums. Now, the, the, interest, the most interesting thing we've done in the last year is there's a security development page. There's a ton of interesting stuff uh, located in the security development page. And what's been opened up is you can provide feedback or if you have interest in it, um, just go to the web page, download the documents, and there's a way to provide feedback about what's going on from a security development perspective uh, in, in the standards. So uh, we had an update in 2019. So in WPA3 2019, you won't, uh, you, th these are some of the things that we did in an off year on how did we want to go back and capture some of the things that were going on. Uh, so we had fast BSS transition and each server certificate validation. So everybody knows fast BSS transition, right? This is 802.11R uh, within the IEEE. So what we did was we actually took the 802.11R testing was scattered around uh, in different locations in some of the Wi-Fi Alliance testing. And we had heard from a lot of feedback uh, out in the field that no one's testing 802.11R to its fullest extent. So we brought all these tests in and now we have uh, a full test suite labeled under WPA3 for 802.11R fast BSS transition. So we test both uh, WPA3 personal, WPA3 enterprise, also WPA2 personal and transition mode for both over the air and over the DS if the stations and the AP support it. One of the other key benefits that we did is we also created a preference order. So if you have multiple ACAMs uh, that are on a BSS, whether it's personal or enterprise, we actually prescribe the order in which you should select those ACAMs. So if it's a personal network, the uh, most secure is FTSAE. So you should select that if it's being offered. Then it goes to SAE, FTPSK, PSK SHA-256, and then PSK with SHA-1. The same thing with enterprise. Uh, with enterprise, it's uh, FTE, then it's EAP SHA-256, and then EAP with SHA-1. Again, we wanted to bring some uh, consistent practices around what was the most secure, when it should connect, and then if there were other options uh, of what the next option should be. Now, EAP Server Certificate Validation, or SCV, uh, this was one that, you know, we had also gotten a lot of feedback about, you know, whether it was evil twin attacks on client devices. You know, we do a lot of stuff where the actual um, 
server validates the client certificate, but not where the client or the station validates the server certificate. So we wanted to try to address some of these longstanding problems we had in WPA2 Enterprise, right? So this is all about attacks that, that were occurring on the inner client authentication. So we created a, uh, you know, we sat down and created a feature, right? Where um, we require the station to perform server certificate validation for any EAP type that's using uh, TLS. So in this case, EAP TLS, TTLS, and PEEP. And we have this concept of trust anchors, right? Where we have a server cert, CA cert, pinned to a network profile and concepts like trust on first use and user override the service certificate. Um, basically when you're doing an onboarding, you're gonna have to trust that first time that you're, you're using that service certificate unless the profile has been pushed to you at some point um, and then you can move forward. We also have a, a capability called uh, trust override disabled where a network operator. So again, if you're in an enterprise scenario and you don't want your end user to be able to override that server cert you can issue a trust override disable where they can't override or change the server cert that they're being validated against. So in this way, SCB can't be disabled. Again, uh, mandatory for uh, Wi-Fi certified WPA3 enterprise. And again, that was starting in uh, December of 2019 in our update. So now on to some of the interesting things. Uh, in WPA3 2020, again, this is just last December, we came out with a bunch of updates. So there's a couple things that we came out with. So SAE hash to element, uh, a feature called transition disabled, SAE public key, Wi-Fi QR code, beacon protection, operating channel validation, and privacy enhancements or MAC randomization uh, topics. So I'll touch on each of these really quickly. Um, SAE hash to element. So as I mentioned in right in the very beginning of the slides uh, when we had crack and then we had dragon blood. So um, SAE hash to element was a response to dragon blood when it got published uh, to help um, uh, address some of the challenges that were brought up in SAE using the hunting and pecking algorithm. So we have this intermediary uh, key, which is derived from the password offline. So that's the key for this. The password that we're gonna be using, right? Or the, the PT that we're deriving from the password happens offline when you create the profile, right? So it's one time per group. So it uh, helps mitigate some of the side channel attacks that we were seeing occur. Uh, it was defined in 802.11, which is now 2020. So ACAMs remain the same, such as SAE and FTSAE, um, but the H2E capability is advertised in an RSNXE message. So again, if the stations don't support, or if you're, the station's connecting to an AP and the AP doesn't support um, hash to element, it will fall back to hunting and pecking. So again, not necessarily a transition mode, but a way not to um, strand stations that are out there. So again, mandatory feature for Wi-Fi certified WPA3. Now, here's some of the interesting news. Um, it, SAE hash to element only exists for six gigahertz bands, right? So you, it doesn't have the older hunting and pecking me mechanism. Uh, six gigahertz only has the hash to element uh, strategy in there solely so that we can start in that clean band and move forward with the latest security. So we'll talk about what's going on in six gigahertz in a little bit. Uh, transition disabled. Again, this is another thing that came out of some of the other um, discussions around security vulnerabilities. It's giving us a way to uh, protect ourselves against transition mode downgrades, right? So if I have a WPA3 transition mode network, uh, personal or enterprise, if I have WPA2, in, in, in the sense WPA2 PSK still on there, I can get downgraded from WPA3 personal to WPA2 personal on that transition mode. So what we wanted to stop is having in those transition modes, right? At some point in time, there'll be a, uh, a mechanism or a time that you're gonna want to disable those transition modes, not just on the infrastructure. This is a way to actually signal to the stations, no longer use transition modes on these network profiles, right? So it's basically the infrastructure signaling to the station, don't use a transition mode on this BSS or this SSID. So. Uh, that what we currently support, WPA3 personal transition mode, SAEPK, WPA3 enterprise, and enhanced open. So basically, if you had a station that was connecting with WPA3 personal transition mode, after it receives a transition disable indication from the network, it will no longer allow WPA2 personal on that BSS. So again, trying to protect from those downgrade attacks. Uh, SAE public key. Uh, this was another thing that, was, that we had done in the Wi-Fi lines. Again, looking for in these small public hotspots, not, not a large hotspot like 
pass calling our hotspot 2.0. How do we try to avoid evil twin attacks by an attacker who knows the password? Again, uh, it was a mechanism where we looked at how do we leverage some of the stuff that's going on in the IEEE today, like SAE, and some public key cryptography uh, to be able to bring in the best of both worlds. So again, it's just an extension to the SAE, so it's using the same AKM, but we're actually just advertising SAE PK in the RSNXE uh, field. Uh, authentication results in a pairwise master key, just like with SAE, um, but the SAE PK network is configured with an elliptic curve public key pair. So we're actually using uh, public private keys in order to uh, validate that AP, right? So the password is actually gonna embed a base 32 fingerprint of the public key of the AP so that we can actually get some resistance to pre-image attacks. And, and this gives us the ability to validate that AP. So again, um, it, it's another mechanism, another tool in the toolkit for uses in uh, public networks and like a, a coffee shop or other places where you still have to publish, you know, a key, a, a passphrase uh, for people to be able to get on the network. Wi-Fi QR code. Again, this was just a, a more of a standardization uh, where, you know, we've seen Wi-Fi QR codes. We actually went back through and just wanted to make them backward compatible uh, with the Wi-Fi URI format. And we just added some new capabilities for the features we were coming out with, such as transition disable, uh, SAPK, and non-ASCII passwords. So again, just more of an update from that perspective on the QR code front. Uh, a couple other features that we, we pulled in from uh, 802.11, which became uh, 802.11.2020, uh, beacon protection and operating channel validation. Again, other things that we were made aware of that could be uh, used to uh, do man in the middle tax and other things were you know, uh, beacon frames typically being vulnerable, as well as operating channels, you know, doing channel switch announcements, being able to uh, intercept a station and switch it to a different channel, to a different BSS, and then allow the man in the middle attacks to occur there. So again, uh, it was being developed in 802.11, uh, RevMD at the time, and then became 802.11.2020. Uh, we had pulled in both of those features to really round out uh, how we were trying to focus on security as more as in, instead of individual features, but really trying to build a more uh, robust protection from you know, initial onboarding beacon frames all the way up to encrypting the data in transit. Again, uh, these are optional features for Wi-Fi certified WPA3. Again, when you, uh, when you go out to the Wi-Fi Alliance website, uh, you can take a look and see which features and, and capabilities, the individual products that you're getting, uh, what they have on the certificates. Uh, kind of at the tail end of what we did for uh, December 2020 uh, in, in this latest WPA3, uh, we tried to address uh, some ground rules around privacy extension mechanisms. Uh, you'll see this is, uh, it was like a, uh, MAC, has, MAC address randomization. Um, it was based off of 802.11.8Q, which was again incorporated in 802.11.2020. Uh, there's a whole wave of uh, work being done around uh, protecting users' privacy. Uh, classically, we've done, uh, you know, identified people's things, devices by their MAC address because the MAC addresses didn't change. However, uh, using MAC addresses in Wi-Fi allows basically everybody to be tracked because the MAC address used to stay consistent or constant uh, when you were roaming. So one of the things that came out, as I said, that was introduced in 11Q, 11AQ was the ability to have your MAC addresses uh, randomized in a sense, being able to use locally significant MAC addresses. So the station can construct these unique randomized MAC addresses, typically per SSID, right? Unless you have this saved network profile in which uh, the way the standard's written, when you come back to that same SSID, you should use the same MAC address. Uh, also, the, the key things that we're trying to protect too is when you're walking around and roaming around with your Wi-Fi turned on during active scanning and not associated to a BSS, and for ANQP exchanges, you're going to continue to randomize your MAC address again to decrease the footprint of any personally identifiable information leakage. Uh, just real quick on MAC address randomization for those that aren't familiar with it. Again, uh, it's based on a rule uh, where we're uh, the first octet, if it ends in 2, 6, A, or E, that's going to be a locally administered or random MAC address. So again, um, there's always a push-pull when we start talking about uh, MAC randomization or protecting identity from a uh, end user side or a station side and then the enterprise side. Uh, there's a bunch of groups, uh, ranges from the Wi-Fi lines to the WBA to the IEEE uh, out there looking at how to best protect users' privacy while not um, impeding 
uh, user experience. So basically making sure things don't break and you're still being able to be protected uh, and your privacy is being able to be adhered to. So uh, with that, so what's next? And this is what I get asked all the time. What's next? So what's on the horizon? So uh, six gigahertz or Wi-Fi 6E, which is just coming out, 60 gigahertz and others. Uh, what do we see on the future and the roadmap for Wi-Fi for security perspective? So from a greenfield perspective, Mac five bands. So again, Wi-Fi 6E, WPA3 is the starting point. WPA3 personal is required. WPA3 enterprise and enterprise 192 are optional. However, and this is the big part, legacy WPA2 and WPA will not be supported at all in the six gigahertz band. So if you have a device that's operating in six gigahertz, it's WPA3 only right now. You will not be able to connect to it with WPA2 personal or WPA2 uh, enterprise. Here's the other big news, open networks are eliminated. So there will be no open networks in six gigahertz. If, a, um, if you have an, a need for an open like network in six gigahertz, it's enhanced open and not enhanced open with transition mode. It's enhanced open only. So what we tried to do in these new uh, Mac 5 bands, eliminate transition modes, eliminate legacy security, start fresh, move forward from here. And mo most importantly, weapon T-Kit, absolutely not supported in these bands. So when I put 2020 and beyond here, this is really uh, uh, WPA3 2020 and beyond is what we're looking at is what do we focus on now? So Wi-Fi security is an obscure technology. Why do I say it's obscure? Again, if I go back to my first slide, most people aren't worried about Wi-Fi security until there's a reason for them to worry about it. So we've been tossing around ideas on what we should do. Is it better UX UI to, to uh, inform users of the security? Uh, consistent cryptography, should we be focusing on things three to five years out as opposed to feature by features? So, uh, you know, I, I love presenting in, in to groups like these because these are opportunities for groups like this to make your voice heard and really kind of drive where we're focusing and where we're going from a Wi-Fi security perspective uh, as we try to get ready for the next uh, future release, which could be two, anywhere between a year to two to three years out. Uh, just as an advanced decoder ring, I want to provide this for everybody. Uh, this gives you the features, uh, which bands that they operate in today and whether they're, they're optional or required. Right, so if I look at the feature, let's just pick enhanced open uh, transition mode. Um, enhanced open transition mode required if enhanced open supported, but you see it in six gigahertz. Enhanced open transition mode is disallowed. The same thing with WPA3 and WPA3 enterprise, no transition modes allowed in six gigahertz. So again, want to make sure everybody had uh, this decoder ring so they could see what, where, and uh, how things are getting deployed from a security perspective. And really just to wrap it up, uh, and again, I appreciate everybody's time. Um, you know, again, what, how do you apply what you've learned today, right? So if I wanna look at this at next week, a couple months and, and uh, you know, half, half a year away, uh, within the next couple of weeks, really identify the devices in your network to support WPA3 and which WPA3 features they support. Even identify which devices support enhanced open. If you can spin up an enhanced open SSID or transition mode SSID for enhanced open on your network, give it a shot, see what you can do. I mean, those are one of the things you can able today to increase minutely some of the security that's going on in your network without being disruptive to all the stations. The other thing, enable a WPA3 transition mode. If, if your goal is to still do WPA2 PSK, uh, try enabling a WPA3 transition mode on an SSID to see which of your stations that are out there, which of your clients are out there that may support WPA3. I'm sure it'll be more shocked than you think on how many devices that are shipping now that actually support WPA3. Six months from now, my, my goal would be to create a WPA3 only SSID. Move forward with the latest security. Um, again, construct this as part of your security architecture and see what you can do there. You know, and, and maybe so, enable some of the more optional uh, features. Again, your mileage is going to vary depending on vendor certifications. So again, really try to plan out that Wi-Fi security roadmap that you have, looking at your devices, looking at your infrastructure, and kind of move forward building that more secure uh, defense in depth architecture around Wi Fi security. So, with that, uh, I'd love to thank everybody for their time. I really appreciate the opportunity to get in front of groups like this uh, and have a session and really just talk about Wi Fi security. So, again, thank you, much appreciated, and looking forward to the questions.